So I will be reading chapters 6 through 9 of The Count of Monte Cristo, Bantam Classics, Abridged Version. Chapter 6 vocabulary is antechamber, gendarm, carbine, fetid, and governor. An antechamber is a small room leading into a larger room. A gendarme is a French police officer. A carbine is a rifle. Fetid means disgusting as in stinky, rotten. Governor is the man in charge of a prison. Chapter 7 vocabulary is Horus, turbulent, and threshold. Horus was an ancient Greek writer who wrote poetry. Turbulent in this context means violent. Threshold is a doorway. Chapter 8 vocabulary is parry, edifice, incurred, or discharged. Parry means to defend as in a fight. Edifice is a monument. Incurred means to receive as in a negative way like a bill or damage. Discharged in this context means to pay off. Chapter 9 vocabulary includes fervent, blasphemies, and despondency, and wrath. Fervent means serious as in religion or love. Blasphemies are curses to God. Despondency is depression, and wrath is severe anger. Things you need to know before reading is that the Chateau de Yves was a prison for important political prisoners. Chateau means castle. It looks like a castle and it's on an island. King Louis XVIII was called the unavoidable king. The Tuileries was his palace. Napoleon Bonaparte is still in exile at the Isle of Elba, but he has lots of supporters. So he will be coming back into power for 111 days, which are called the 100 days. And then he is permanently exiled to St. Helena. Waterloo is where he was defeated by Lord Wellington of the English. He, um, so the word Waterloo is synonymous with ultimate defeat. Number six. As he passed through the antechamber, the police commissary motioned to two gendarmes who placed themselves on either side of Dante's. A door leading to the Palace of Justice was opened, and they passed through one of those long, dark corridors which bring an involuntary shudder to all those who enter them. Just as Villefort's apartment communicated with the Palace of Justice, so the Palace of Justice communicated with the prison. After turning down a number of different corridors, Dante's and his escort came to an iron door. It opened and clanged shut behind him. He now breathed a different air, foul and heavy. He was in prison. He was led to a rather clean cell whose appearance aroused no fear in him. Besides, Villefort's reassuring words still echoed in his ear. Night soon fell and the cell was plunged in darkness. With the loss of his sight, his hearing became more acute. At the slightest sound, he would stand up and walk to the door of his cell, convinced that he was about to be set free. But soon the sound would die away in another direction and he would sink back onto his stool. Finally, toward 10 o'clock, just as he was beginning to lose hope, he heard footsteps outside in the corridor. They stopped before his cell. A key turned in the lock and the massive door opened, revealing the dazzling light of two torches. Dante saw four gendarmes. Have you come for me? He asked. Yes. Were you sent by the deputy public prosecutor? Of course. The knowledge that they had been sent by Villefort relieved the unfortunate young man of all anxiety. He placed himself calmly in the middle of his escort. A police van was waiting for him in the street. The door was opened and he felt himself being pushed inside before he had time to say anything, although he had no intention of resisting. A moment later, he was sitting between two gendarmes with the other two seated opposite him. The heavy van set out for its unknown destination. When it finally stopped, Dantes found himself in the port. Two of the gendarmes got out first, then Dantes was followed by the other two. The four of them led him to a boat which a customs officer was holding alongside the quay by a chain. 
He was soon to be seated in the stern of the boat, still surrounded by the four gendarmes, while a police officer placed himself in the bow. The boat was shoved off. Four oarsmen began to row vigorously, and before long, Dantes found himself outside the harbor. Where are you taking me? He asked one of the gendarmes. You'll know soon enough, but we're forbidden to give you any information. Dante said no more. He waited silently and thoughtfully, trying to pierce the shadows of the night with the practiced eye of a sailor accustomed to space and darkness. Meanwhile, the oarsmen had stopped rowing and hoisted a sail. Finally, despite his reluctance to question the gendarme a second time, Dante said to him, Comrade, in the name of your conscience, I beg you to take pity on me and answer me. I've been falsely accused of some sort of treason, but I'm a good and loyal Frenchman. Where are you taking me? Tell me, and on my honor as a sailor, I'll do nothing except resign myself to my fate. Unless you're blindfolded or have never been outside the harbor of Marseille, replied the gendarme, you must be able to guess where you're going by now. Look around you. Dante stood up and looked in the direction the boat was moving. Several hundred yards ahead rose the steep black rock on which stood the somber Chateau d'If. The unexpected appearance of this dreaded prison with its centuries-old tradition of terror produced the same effect on Dante's as the sight of a gallows on a man condemned to death. Oh my God, he cried out. The Chateau d'If, what are we going there for? The gendarme smiled. You can't be taking me there to be imprisoned, went on Dante's. The Chateau d'If is a state prison used only for important political prisoners. I've committed no crime. Am I really going to be imprisoned there? Probably. But Monsieur de Villefort promised. I don't know what Monsieur de Villefort promised you, said the gendarme. All I know is that we're going to the Chateau d'If. Wait, quick, men, come here. Dantes had tried to throw himself into the sea, but four vigorous arms pulled him back as soon as his feet left the bottom of the boat. He fell back, howling with rage. All right, my friend said the gendarme, pinning him down with his knee. If you make one more movement, just one, I'll put a bullet through your head. And Dantes felt the muzzle of a carbine pressed against his temple. A short time later, he felt the boat strike something and realized they had landed. His guards pulled him to his feet, made him climb out of the boat, and dragged him toward the steps which led up to the citadel. He made no useless resistance. His slowness came from inertia rather than opposition. He felt numb, and he staggered as though he were drunk. He was aware of steps which forced him to raise his feet. He noticed that he had gone through a door which had closed behind him, but he did everything mechanically, and he seemed to be surrounded by a thick fog. He finally came to a halt. Certain that he could no longer flee, the guards released him. After a wait of ten minutes or so, a voice said, Have the prisoner follow me. I'll take him to his cell. Go on, said one of the gendarmes, pushing him. Dantes followed his guide into a room which was almost entirely underground, whose bare, oozing walls seemed to be impregnated with tears. A sort of lamp standing on a stool, its wick swimming in fetid oil, illuminated this frightful lodging and allowed Dantes to see his guide, a subaltern jailer with dirty clothes and a stupid face. This is your room for tonight, he said. It's late and the governor's asleep. Tomorrow, when he's read his instructions concerning you, he may have you put into another cell. In the meanwhile, here's some bread. There's water in that jug, and there's some straw on the floor over there in the corner. You have everything a prisoner could wish for. Good night. Before Dantes could say anything in reply, the jailer picked up the lamp, walked out, and locked the door behind him, leaving the cell in utter darkness. When the first rays of dawn were beginning to bring back a little light to the cell, the jailer reappeared, having received orders to leave the prisoner where he was. Dantes had not moved. He seemed to have been nailed to the same spot where he had stopped when he entered the night before. He had spent the whole night standing up without sleeping for a single instant. The jailer walked up to him, but Dantes did not seem to see him. He tapped him on the shoulder. Dantes started and shook his head. Haven't you slept? asked the jailer. I don't know. Aren't you hungry? I don't know. Do you want anything? I want to see the governor. That's impossible. Why? because the regulations of the prison don't allow prisoners to request it. What is allowed here? Better food if you pay for it, walks outside, and sometimes books. I don't need books. I don't feel like taking a walk and the food is good enough for me. I want only one thing. I want to see the governor. Listen, said the jailer, don't start brooding over something impossible like that or you'll go mad within two weeks. Do you think so? Of course, that's how madness always begins. 
For example, there was a priest who used to have this same cell, was constantly offering to give the governor a million francs if he would set him free that finally twisted his brain. What happened to him? They put him in the dungeon. Listen, said Dantes, I'm not a priest. I'm not mad. I can't offer you a million francs, but I can offer you 300 francs if you'll deliver a letter to a girl named Mercedes the next time you go to Marseille. Not even a letter, just two or three lines. If I took those two or three lines and got caught with them, I'd be discharged. I make a thousand francs a year here, not counting the food, so I'd be an idiot to risk losing a thousand francs on the chance of earning 300. Listen then, if you refuse to deliver a letter to Mercedes or at least let her know I'm here, someday I'll be hiding behind the door when you come in and I'll break open your head with a stool. Threats, cried the jailer, stepping back and putting himself on the defensive. The priest began like that. Within three days, you'll be raving mad, just as he is. It's a good thing there are dungeons in the Chateau d'If. Dantes picked up the stool. All right, all right, said the jailer. Since you're so set on it, I'll go tell the governor. Good, said Dantes. He set the stool on the floor and sat down on it with a bowed head and haggard eyes as though he were actually mad. The jailer went out and returned an instant later with four soldiers and a corporal. By order of the governor, he said, take the prisoner to the floor below this one. To the dungeon, asked the corporal. That's right. We have to put madmen with madmen. The four soldiers took hold of Dante's, who fell into a kind of apathy and followed them without resistance. He descended 15 steps. The door of a cell was opened and he entered, mumbling to himself, he's right. They have to put madmen with madmen. Chapter seven. In his small study at the Tuileries in Paris, seated at a walnut table, which he had brought back from his exile at Hartwell and to which he was greatly attached, King Louis XVIII listened rather absent-mindedly to a gray-haired, aristocratic-looking gentleman of about 50. His majesty continued to make notes in the margin of his edition of Horace as this gentleman spoke to him. What were you saying? said the king. That I'm extremely worried, sire. I have good reason to believe that a storm is brewing in the south. I'm afraid you've been misinformed, Duke. I know for certain that the weather is fine down there. Intelligent as he was, Louis XVIII was given to facile jesting. Your Majesty may be quite right in counting on the good sense of the French people, but I don't think I'm entirely wrong in fearing the possibility of some desperate attempt. And by whom? By Bonaparte, or at least by his partisans. My dear Blackus, said the king, your alarm is keeping me from working. And your feeling of security keeps me from sleeping, sire. My alarm doesn't come from vague, unfounded rumors, but from an intelligent, trustworthy man who has just arrived from Marseille to tell me a great danger threatens the king. I therefore came to you immediately, sire. I think it is in extremely important that you see Monsieur de Villefort. Monsieur de Villefort, exclaimed the king. Is he the man who just arrived from Marseille? Why didn't you tell me his name immediately? I thought the name was unknown to your majesty. Not at all. He's a serious-minded young man, honorable, intelligent, and above all, ambitious. Furthermore, you know his father by name. His father? Yes. His name is Nortia. Nortia the Gerundine. Precisely. And your majesty has employed the son of such a man. Blackus, my dear friend, you don't understand these things. I told you Villefort was ambitious. He would sacrifice anything to his ambition, even his own father. Shall I bring him to you, sire? Yes, immediately. The duke hurried out of the room with the alacrity of a young man and returned a short time later with Villefort. As the door opened, the latter found himself face to face with the king. He stopped short. Come in, Monsieur de Villefort. Come in, said the king. Villefort bowed and took a few steps forward, waiting for the queen, king to question him. Monsieur de Villefort, said Louis XVIII, the duke here informs me you have something important to tell us. The duke is right, sire. I have come from Paris as rapidly as possible to inform your majesty that in the exercise of my duties, I have discovered a conspiracy of dire importance, a veritable tempest which directly threatens your majesty's throne. Sire, the usurper has manned three vessels and has by now almost certainly left the Isle of Elba. His destination is unknown, but he will surely attempt a landing either at Naples or on the Tuscany coast or in France itself. 
Your majesty is in no doubt aware that the usurper has maintained partisans in both Italy and France. Yes, I know that, said the king, strongly agitated. But please continue. How did you learn these facts? I learned them in Marseille from a man whom I had been watching for a long time and whom I had arrested the day I left from Paris. This man, a turbulent sailor whom I had previously suspected of Bonapartism, had made a secret trip to the Isle of Elba. The marshal there entrusted him with a verbal message for a certain Bonapartist in Paris whose name I was unable to make him tell me. But I did learn that he was to instruct this Bonapartist in Paris to prepare his adherence for a return of the usurper within a short time. And where is this man now? Asked the king. In prison, sire. Ah, here's Monsieur d'Andre, cried the duke. The minister of police had just appeared on the threshold. He was pale, trembling, and almost wild-eyed with terror. The king violently pushed back the table at which he was sitting and cried out, What's the matter, Bellon? You look panic-stricken. Does your alarm have anything to do with what Monsieur de Villefort was just telling me? Sire! Sire! stammered the baron. Speak! The minister of police threw himself at the king's feet in despair and cried out, a terrible disaster, sire. The usurper left the Isle of Elba on the 28th of February, and on the 1st of March, he landed in France at a little port near Antibes. The usurper landed in France near Antibes only 250 leagues from Paris on the 1st of March, and you only learned of it today, the 3rd of March. Impossible. Either you've been misinformed or you're mad. Last, sire, it's only too true. Louis the Eighteenth made a gesture of unspeakable anger and alarm and leaped to his feet. In France, he cried. The usurper is in France. Wasn't he being watched? But who knows, perhaps certain persons were in league with him. Oh, sire, exclaimed the duke. A man like Monsieur Dandre can't be accused of treason. We were all blind. He merely shared the common blindness. But, began Villefort, then stopping short, he said, Forgive me, sire, forgive me. I was carried away by my zeal. Go on, speak boldly, said the king. You were only, you were the only one to warn us of this disaster. Help us now to remedy it. Sire, said Villefort, the usurper is detested in the south. It will not be difficult to make province and Languedoc rise up against him. No doubt, said the minister, but he's advancing by way of Joppe and Cisteron. He's advancing, exclaimed the king. Do you mean he's marching on Paris? The minister of police kept a silence, which was equivalent to the most complete avowal. In that case, said the king, I have no fells or need of you, and you may withdraw. What remains to be done now concerns the minister of war. Monsieur de Villefort, you are no doubt quite tired from your long journey. Go get some rest. You stay at your father's house, won't you? Villefort felt as though he were about to faint. No, sir, he said. I'll stay at the Hotel de Madrid in the Rue de Tournon. Oh, yes, said the king, smiling. I was forgetting that you're not on good terms with Monsieur Nautier, which is another sacrifice to the royal cause for which I must reward you. Sire, the kindness you have already shown me is a reward which so far surpasses all my ambitions that I have nothing more to ask. And be that as it may... We shall not forget you. In the meantime, take this. The king took off the cross of the Legion of Honor, which he customarily wore next to the cross of St. Louis, and handed it to Villefort. Villefort's eyes filled with tears of pride and joy. He took the cross and kissed it. Go now, said the king. And if I should happen to forget you, a king's memory is short. Don't be afraid to bring yourself to my attention. As Villefort was leaving the Tuileries with the minister of police, the latter said to him, You've made a magnificent beginning, Monsieur de Villefort. Your fortune is assured now. I wonder how long it will take, thought Villefort. Chapter 8. Events followed one another swiftly. The story of Napoleon's strange, miraculous return from Elba is well known. Unexampled in the past, it will probably remain unimitated in the future. Louis XVIII made only feeble efforts to parry the blow. The monarchy, which he had scarcely finished reconstructing, trembled on its insecure foundations, and a single gesture from Napoleon was enough to bring down the whole edifice, which had been nothing more than a formless mixture of ancient prejudices and new ideas. 
Villefort therefore gained nothing from the king except a gratitude which was not only useless, but even dangerous. Napoleon would no doubt have dismissed him had it not been for the protection of his father, Monster Nortier, who had great power at the court of a hundred days. Villefort kept his post, but his marriage, while not abandoned, was postponed until happier times. If Napoleon remained in power, Villefort would require a different wife, and his father undertook to find one for him. If, on the other hand, a second restoration were to bring Louis XVIII back to the throne, Monsieur de saint Moran's influence would be twice as great as before, and a marriage with his daughter would become more advantageous to Villefort than ever. As for Dante's, he remained a prisoner. Lost in the depths of his dungeon, he heard nothing about either the fall of Louis XVIII or the collapse of the empire. Three times during this brief revival of the empire known as the Hundred Days, Monsieur Morel came to see Villefort and insist that Dante's be set free. And each time, Villefort calmed him with promises and hopes. Then came Waterloo. Morel no longer came to see Villefort. He had done everything he could for his young friend. To make new efforts to procure his liberty under that second restoration would have been simply to compromise himself uselessly. When Louis XVIII returned to the throne, Villefort asked for and obtained the post of public prosecutor, which was vacant at Toulouse. Two weeks later, he married Mademoiselle de saint Moran, whose father stood in higher favor at the court than ever. During Napoleon's short return to power, Danglars was afraid. He expected to see Dante's reappear at any moment, threatening, strong, and eager for vengeance. He therefore handed Monsieur Morel his resignation and entered the service of a Spanish merchant. He left for Madrid, and nothing more was heard of him. Fernand showed less concern. Dante's was absent. That was all he needed to know, and he did not seek to learn what had become of him. Meanwhile, the empire made one last appeal to its soldiers and every man capable of bearing arms rushed to obey the voice of the emperor. Fernand left along with the others, leaving Mercedes behind and tormented by the dark, terrible thought that his rival might return during his absence and marry the woman he loved. His devotion to Mercedes, the compassion he seemed to have for her sorrow, the, the zeal with which he anticipated her slightest desire, all these things produced the effect which signs of devotion always produce in a noble heart. Mercedes had always been fond of Fernand as a friend. Her affection was now deepened by a new feeling, gratitude. He went off to the army with the hope that if Dante's did not return, Mercedes might someday belong to him. Mercedes was left alone. Bathed in tears, she was seen ceaselessly wandering around the little village of the Catalans, sometimes standing motionless in the blazing heat of the southern sun, sometimes sitting on the beach, listening to the eternal moaning of the sea and asking herself whether it would not be better to let herself sink into the depths rather than undergo the cruel suffering of a weight without hope. She did not lack the courage to do the deed. It was her religion which came to her aid and saved her from suicide. Dante's father lost all hope when the empire fell. Five months after he had been separated from his son, he breathed his last in Mercedes' arms. Monsieur Morel paid for his funeral and discharged the small debts which the old man had incurred during his illness. It took more than benevolence to do this. It took courage. The South was aflame. And to help the father of a Bonapartist as dangerous as Dante's, even on his deathbed, was a crime. Chapter 9 Dante's passed through all the stages of misery endured by prisoners forgotten in a dungeon. He began with pride, which is the result of hope and a consciousness of innocence. Then he began to doubt even his innocence. Finally, his pride collapsed and he began to pray, not yet to God, but to men. He begged to be taken from his cell and put into another one, even if it should be darker and deeper. A change, even disadvantageous, would afford him a distraction of several days. 
He begged to be given books and to be allowed to take walks outside. None of these things was granted to him, but he continued to ask for them. Finally, having exhausted all his human resources, Dante's turned to God. He remembered the prayers his mother had taught him and found meanings in them of which he had formerly been unaware. For the happy man, prayer is only a jumble of words until the day when sorrow comes to explain to him the sublime language by means of which he speaks to God. Despite his fervent prayers, however, he remained a prisoner. His soul became dark and a cloud seemed to pass before his eyes. His mind was filled with a simple thought, that of his happiness destroyed for no apparent reason. Then his despondency gave way to wrath he roared blasphemies which made his jailer recoil in horror and dashed himself furiously against the walls of his prison. The informer's letter which Villafort had shown him, which he himself had touched, came back to his mind. He seemed to see each line of it blazing forth letters of fire. He told himself that it was the hatred of men, not the vengeance of God, which had plunged himself into the abyss where he now found himself. He doomed these unknown men to all the torture his fiery imagination could contrive, but even the cruelest ones seemed too mild and too short for them, for after the torment would come death, which would bring them, if not rest, at least the insensibility which resembles it. The thought that death brings release from suffering led him to the idea of suicide. Once he had given himself up to it, he found consolation in it. All his pain and sorrow seemed to flee from his cell at the silent approach of the angel of death. His life seemed more bearable when he reflected that he could cast it aside like a tattered garment whenever he chose. There were two ways to die. The first was to tie his handkerchief to a bar in the window and hang himself. The second was to starve himself. The first was repugnant to him. He had been raised to have a horror of pirates, men who were hanged from the yard arms of ships, Hanging was therefore something dishonorable which he could not bring himself to undergo. He chose the second alternative and swore to carry it through. I'll throw my food out the window, he thought. It will look as though I've eaten it. From that day onward, twice a day, he threw his food out the small barred window through which he could see nothing but the sky. At first gaily, then thoughtfully, then regretfully. He had formerly found his food repulsive, but now hunger made it appear appetizing to the eye and exquisite to the smell. Sometimes he would stand for over an hour staring at a piece of rotten meat or a crust of black moldy bread, but then he would remember the oath he had sworn to himself, and the fear of despising himself kept him from violating it. Finally, the day came when he no longer had the strength to stand up in order to throw away his supper. The next day, he could no longer see and could scarcely hear. The jailer believed him to be seriously ill. Dante's expected death within a short time. A numbness, which was not without a certain feeling of well-being, took possession of him. The pangs in his stomach ceased. When he closed his eyes, he saw bright flashes of light. Suddenly, toward nine o'clock at night, he heard a faint noise coming from the wall next to which he was lying. So many loathsome animals had made their noises in his cell that he had gradually become accustomed to them and did not let his sleep be disturbed by them. But this time, whether because his senses had been intensified by abstinence, because the noise was actually louder than usual, or because at that supreme moment everything took on greater importance, Dante's raised his head to listen. He heard a regular scratching sound, which might be coming from either a large claw, a powerful tooth, or some sort of instrument. The sound continued for about three hours, and then he heard what seemed to be something crumbling, and there was silence. The next morning, it began again, so distinctly that he could hear it without effort. There's no doubt now, he said to himself. Since the sound goes on, even in the daytime, it must be some prisoner working to escape. Oh, if I were only with him, how oh, I'd help him. Then a dark cloud suddenly passed over the hope that had dawned in his mind. What if the sound were only caused by workmen repairing some nearby cell? It would be easy to find out by asking the jailer, but such a question might be dangerous. Unfortunately, 
Dantes was so weak and giddy that he was unable to think consecutively. He could think of only one way to restore his lucidity. He took the broth, which the jailer had left for him, and drank it. He soon felt order returning to his scattered thoughts. After a time, he said to himself, there's only one way I can find without risk. I'll knock on the wall. If it's a workman, he'll stop for a moment and try to guess the cause of the sound, but then he'll go back to work. But if it's a prisoner, the sound will frighten him. He'll stop working and won't begin again until night when he'll assume that everyone else is asleep. He stood up. This time his legs were steady and his eyes saw clearly. He went over to a corner of his cell, pulled out a stone which had been loosened by the dampness and struck the wall three times at the spot where the noise could be heard most distinctly. The noise stopped as if by magic. Dante's listened intently. The entire day passed without the renewal of the noise. It's a prisoner, said Dante's to himself with unspeakable joy. Life came surging back to him. He did not sleep that night, but he still heard no sound from the wall. The next morning, he devoured the food which the jailer brought him. He continued to listen for the noise to begin again, exasperated by the prudence of that prisoner who had not guessed that he had been distracted from his work of escape by another prisoner who was as eager to be free as he was. Three days went by. Seventy-two hours counted minute by minute. Then one evening, after the jailer had made his last visit, Dante's pressed his ear to the wall for the hundredth time and seemed to feel an almost imperceptible vibration. He walked around his cell several times to calm himself, then returned to the same spot and put his ear to the wall again. He was no longer in doubt. Something was taking place on the other side of the wall. The prisoner had recognized the danger of his first maneuver and had adopted another. In order to continue his work in greater safety, he had probably substituted the crowbar for the chisel. Encouraged by this discovery, Dante's resolved to come to the aid of the tireless worker. He pushed back his bed, behind which the work seemed to be going on, and looked around for an object which he could use as a tool. He saw nothing. He had no knife or any other sort of metal instrument. He had so often assured himself that the iron bars in the windows were solidly attached that he knew it was useless to try them again. He had only one resource, to break his earthenware pitcher and use one of the jagged fragments. He picked it up and dropped it to the floor, it flew into pieces. He chose two or three sharp fragments, hid them under his mattress, and left the others scattered on the floor. Breaking the pitcher was such a natural accident that the jailer would show no concern over it. Dante's had the whole night before him, but it was difficult to work in the darkness, and soon he felt his shapeless tool being blunted against the hard stone. He therefore pushed his bed back in place and waited for daylight. All night long, he listened to the unknown prisoner carrying on his underground work. When the jailer came the next morning, Dantes told him the pitcher had slipped out of his hands and fallen to the floor. The jailer grumbled and went off to get his new pitcher without taking the trouble to remove the pieces of the old one. He returned a while later, told the prisoner to be more careful in the future, and went out. As soon as he was gone, Dantes pushed back his bed and saw that his work of the night before had been useless for he had attacked the stone directly rather than the mortar around it. His heart pounded with joy when he discovered that he could scrape away bits of this mortar. They were extremely small bits, to be sure, but within half an hour, he had scraped off a handful of them. Three days later, he had succeeded in removing all the mortar from around the stone. He now had to dislodge it. He tried to do so with his fingernails, but they were insufficient for this task. The fragments of the pitcher broke when he tried to use them as levers. After an hour of vain efforts, he stood up, full of anguish. Was he to be stopped right at the beginning? Would he have to wait, inert and useless, while the other prisoner did everything? Suddenly, an idea occurred to him, and he smiled. Every day, the jailer brought him his soup in a saucepan which had a metal handle. Dantes would have given 10 years of his life for that metal handle. That day, as usual, Jailer filled his bowl from the saucepan. After he had left, Dantes placed the bowl on the floor between the door and the table. The next time the Jailer entered, he stepped on the bowl and broke it into pieces. This time, Dantes was not to blame. He was wrong to leave his bowl on the floor, to be sure, but the Jailer ought to have looked where he was going. 
so he contented himself with grumbling. Then he looked around to find something else into which he could pour the soup, but there was nothing. Leave the saucepan, said Dante, so you can pick it up again tomorrow. This suggestion appealed to the jailer's laziness. He would have no need to go upstairs, come back down, and then go up again. He left the saucepan. Dante shivered with joy. After waiting an hour to make sure the jailer would not change his mind, he pushed back his bed and began to pry out the loosened stone using the handle of the saucepan as a lever. An hour later, he had pulled the stone from the wall, making an excavation of more than a foot and a half in diameter. Then, eager to take advantage of that night in which chance, or rather his own ingenuity, had placed such a previous instrument in his hands, he continued to work furiously. The next morning, the jailer placed a piece of bread on his table. Didn't you bring me another bowl? asked Dantes. No, you break everything. First your pitcher, then your bowl. I'll leave you the saucepan and pour your soup into it. Dantes raised his eyes to heaven and clasped his hands under his blanket. That piece of metal aroused deeper gratitude in his heart than the greatest stroke of good fortune he had ever known in his former life. However, he had noticed his work caused the other prisoner to stop. But this was no reason to stop working. If his neighbor would not come to him, he would go to his neighbor. He worked all day without stopping. By evening, thanks to his new tool, he'd taken at least 10 handfuls of mortar and small stones from the wall. He interrupted his work when the time came for the jailer's evening visit and straightened out the handle of the saucepan as best he could. He resumed his efforts after the jailer had left, but after two or three hours of labor, he encountered an obstacle. He felt it with his hands and realized that he had reached a beam which ran directly across the passage he had begun. Oh my God, my God, he cried out. I prayed to you so long and I thought you had listened to me at last. Dear God, have pity on me. Don't let me die in despair. Who speaks of God and despair in the same breath? said a muffled voice which seemed to come from under the earth. Dantes felt his hair stand on end and he called out, in the name of God, speak to me again, whoever you are. Who are you? asked the voice. A wretched prisoner, can answered Dantes. How long have you been here? Since February 28th, 1815. What was your crime? I'm innocent. Then what are you accused of? Of conspiring for the return of Napoleon? What? Do you mean that Napoleon is no longer in power? He abdicated at Fountainebleau in 1814 and was exiled to the Isle of Elba. How long have you been here that you do not know that? Since 1811. Dante shuddered. That man had been in prison four years longer than he had. Very well. Stop digging, said the voice, speaking rapidly. At what depth is the excavation you've made? It's on level with the ground. How is it hidden? Behind my bed. Has anyone ever moved your bed since you've been in prison? Never. What's outside your cell? A corridor. Where does the corridor lead to? To our courtyard? Alas, murmured the voice. What's the matter? Cried Dantes. I was mistaken. The imperfection of my drawings misled me. One inaccurate line on my plan was equivalent to 15 feet in reality, and I took the wall in which you're digging for the wall of the citadel. But you would have only reached the sea. That's what I wanted. I intended to jump into the sea and swim to the Isle of Dom or the Isle of Tabulin or even to the mainland. Would you have been able to swim that far? God would have given me the strength, but now all is lost. Steal up your passage carefully. Don't work any more and wait till you hear from me. At least tell me who you are. I'm, I'm prisoner number 27. Don't you trust me? Asked Dantes. He heard a bitter laugh. How old are you? Your voice seems to be that of a young man. I don't know my age because I haven't measured the time since I came here. All I know is that I was 19 when I was arrested in 1815. Not quite 26, murmured the voice. Well, a man isn't yet a traitor at that age. Oh no, cried Dantes. I let them cut me to pieces before I'd betray you. Your age reassures me. I'll come to you. Wait for me. When will you come? Let me calculate the risks. I'll give you a signal. But you won't abandon me, will you? We'll escape together. Or if we can't escape, we'll talk together. If you're young, I'll be your comrade. If you're old, I'll be your son. 
Very well, said the voice. Until tomorrow, then. Dante stood up, placed the stone back in the wall, and pushed his bed in front of it. From that moment on, he gave himself up completely to his new happiness. He was no longer going to be alone, and he might even be free. That night, he thought the other prisoner would take advantage of the silence and the darkness to renew his conversation with him, but he was mistaken. He heard nothing all night long. The next morning, however, after the jailer's visit, he heard three knocks on the wall. Is it you? He asked. Here I am. Has your jailer gone? Asked the voice. Yes, he won't be back until this evening. We have 12 hours of freedom. A moment later, Dante's heard the sound of a mass of stones and earth falling, and a hole appeared in the bottom of the passage he had begun to dig. Then he saw a head emerge from this hole, and soon a man had climbed up out of it and into his cell.